Charlie Burr, S H A R L A N B R O B E R G. Uh, because I've been advocating for the Anchor Out community and, uh, because the city has been proactively in the waterfront management plan, crushing the only shelter that they have and the electric regulations. Um, they are defined as homeless because they're not in a secure boat slip. And so to take their only way to shelter and then berate them and discriminate against them, not that they are it's just ludicrous. And they spent one and a half million dollars to rob people of their dignity and force them outside of the industrial area. They'd rather spend a third to do the right thing with all the I saw I was there as an advocate for the anchor out at the camp. I go, I cook, I bring food, you know, household items, just advocating for people because many people don't know their rights. Well, yeah, there's been a history of negative relations between residents of the encampment and local law enforcement, and then as advocates and journalists, um, they started targeting us as well for helping the community and supporting their cause. Yes. I would prefer not to do this time, but yes, they harassed me. Um, I filed citizen complaints because uh, one of the officers involved was stalking me and caught up in my uh, hiding next to my house at night time. And when I came out and approached him, he placed himself back on the side of the building. I said, What are you doing? Why are you here? And he threatened to arrest me. And that's not the only incident. <laughs> so, in terms of what happened with Jeremy, you know, if you could just describe again. I mean, I just, like, how did you begin, like, all of a sudden, the office? What do you remember about that? Yeah, so Jeremy was there uh, filming. He was called in by one of the anchor outs, and um, he was filming, you know, just general everyday stuff that goes on at the encampment. Um, and, you know, the boats and, you know, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and Jeremy had set up and was filming, and they apparently, you know, there was some dialogue exchange uh, between him and the officers. He was just asking the journal journalists questions, and uh, next thing you know, they retracted and sort of bumped up uh, on his right and George, I believe, so we all to the side. And then um, George approached Jeremy and, like, was surrounded him and pressing himself against him and then at the part that I saw um, I saw Sergeant George's lunge on top of the chair and he might have a matter I'm sad to say that when I first, I'm from the Bay Area, I was born and raised in San Jose, um, and I came to Marin, Sausalito in particular, as a peaceful and unsuspecting place, and it's, my experience here has been far from that over the course of, I've followed the encampment over the course of the years, we've done the peace and friendship, and I have to say that what's going on here is the epitome of systemic racism and socioeconomic bias. And I have a long chronology of police misconduct here that I've reported in it for all Sunday years. I did live in the city, so I'm just I'm making your contact for the future show. That's fine. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. 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 There's a lot more to this story. So she used to be this morning. Yes. 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 It's, it's pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy. Um, so, yeah. And basically, that's what it is. You know, um, when the encampment was at Dunby, you know, really, this is. Um, they, they don't want people here that they deem unworthy or in the, um, uh, this is international tourism, you know, so although they have vac vacant buildings here, they refuse to turn it into an emergency shelter. Um, so they spend a ton of money to circumvent Martin versus Boise and to then transfer people to the industrial area. Park and uh, Mayor Hoffman, the former mayor, um, lives right across the street. And I've never seen her come there, donate, repurpose an item, bring a meal, anything. So they forced the people into the industrial area, in my opinion, to get them out of sight. Yeah. You know,
know, and rather than just raising, they could have spent a third of the money. I work in real estate, so I know how to run the numbers, and, we, and I have a background in human services. I ran one of the biggest transitional housing projects under HUD, but they won't listen to me. The other story I covered last week was the H the Works for Green Brain, Project Home Key. Yes. You were following that at all. Yes. Things got very heated. Yes. The idea of having a shelter in that large square area. Yes. Um, well, and what doesn't make any sense about that whole idea anyway is the homeless population, or should I say, unhoused population in San Rafael is phenomenally bigger than this, much bigger than this. So what are what is the purpose in sending people to another city north that has a bigger problem than there is here? Right? If there's, say, hypothetically 40 or 50 beds that are going to be available at the Larkspur location, I think those are the numbers that I heard, what, what do they expect? That they're going to send everyone from Sausalito there? What about the people in San Rafael? You know, so it's just, and, and that's the thing. The, the uh, Marin Theater has sat vacant for years, and it's for lease. But the city refuses to lease it because the constituents on the hill don't want a shelter. They, they think that devalues their real estate. That's not what devalues the real estate. Overlooking an unhoused person's encampment is what devalues the real estate here. But they refuse to do the right thing. They would rather spend more money to force these people outside to walk them under their dignity and human rights. And it's terrible. So first of all, I want to welcome everybody to this important holiday. This is uh, John Lewis's birthday, the champion of civil rights. John Lewis and I spent some time together in Selma, Alabama, and in jail. Also, we spent a month in jail in Jackson uh, in 1965, and it was also from 63 to 65, we were in jail together in my hometown of Selma, Alabama, which is unfortunate, and the point of today is that this is President's Day. A group of men who put together a very, very important document called the United States Constitution. In addition to John Lewis's birthday, this particular document is the mandate. And here we are 75 years later from Selma to Sausalito, and we have officers like Chief Rohrbacher and Sergeant George's brutalizing journalists as though they are criminals, when in fact it's the cops who are the criminals. I don't know if you've seen the video of what happened to Jeremy. Jeremy? Right Where are you, Jeremy? Come over here. This Jeremy has been a journalist in this town and in Sonoma for the last 25 years. He's covered all kinds of incidents of public importance, and he was covering the homeless camp that has been created by the city of Sausalito. And I want um, uh, Robbie to come and talk about what is going on and why this is such an important case of public, of public importance. What is going on with the homeless here? Because this is the backdrop against which Jeremy was filming on the day that he was brutalized and criminally attacked by the Sausalito Police Department. So here is uh, Robbie. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. So here in Sausalito, there is a sh just a, an appalling disregard of the law by Sausalito Police, by the Richardson Bay Regional Agency that's been crushing people's homes, crushing people's boats out on Richardson Bay. And the festering abhorrence that this exclusive enclave has against working class people, against people that do not fit in to the exclusive pedigree of those who live up on the hill, has allowed corruption and police violence to fester on the waterfront. That, the encampment, Camp Cormorant, is a result of the policies of the city of Sausalito and the Richardson Bay Regional Agency crushing people's boat homes on the anchorage without any due process of law. Um, I personally, I've been, just from advocating, I've been arrested like 
six times, seven times. I got a whole bunch of times where they, they filed charges against me to the DA's office. I didn't even know. I had to go, I went to the DA's office. I have four no charges filed at the DA's office of of criminal cases that Sausalito PD put on to me. I have one that in Contra Costa County where a boat was towed to a, a, a marina there illegally and destroyed, where I tried to intervene and was also arrested. Again, no charges filed. I got an illegal camping ticket down at and got choked out by Sergeant Georges for having a tent up. Again, found not guilty in absentia, didn't even show up to my court date, and they found me not guilty. So, That's power. right there, this the, they, they feel like they're above the law, and today, this lawsuit is going to start changing the tide because now accountability is coming. And right now I have in my hand 1,800 signatures of people who are demanding that Sergeant Georges be removed. This is a dangerous cop. This is a violent man in a position of authority with a record of attacking people and getting away with it because John Rohrbacher just like it just looks the other way because the the festering abhorrence that this city has against people that don't fit in is allowing cruelty to run the city of Sausalito. And with that, I want to pass it off to Jeff, um, who's a uh, who's not only he is a, a leader on the Anchorage, lives out on a boat, has also ran, been suppressed as a voter trying to run for election in the city of Sausalito. He tried to run for the city of Sausalito and they dragged his boat out into the unincorporated waters so he couldn't run for office. So this, there's voter suppression going on in the city of Sausalito. This is a national, this is a national issue and we're witnessing it right now. So here's Jeff Chase. Uh, thank you, Robbie Paulson. Really uh, inspiring and Charles Bonner and, and Jeremy Porcha, especially a real journalist that came to witness what started as a First Amendment demonstration and protest and has now become a FEMA jail. Good morning and welcome to Jubilito. The city of Sausalito is a legal fiction. It's organized on the cinders of Water Street. That was the headquarters of the Mariners that burnt down mysteriously on the eve of the city's incorporation a hundred plus years ago. What this place really is inhabited by is flesh and blood, human beings, all equal in the founding documents. And especially in God's eyes. A billion dollars is not a billion votes. If and when, which is the same word in Hebrew, the government of this town, the mayor, the city council, and the city manager are unelected, recalled, or resign, we can begin again. Jubilee is declared. That's freedom, that's forgiveness, and that's fruit trees, not war and poverty and pollution. We can start tying these government officials with their financial connections to the consultants and contractors, as well as the polluters and weapons manufacturers. They picked the wrong sailors to be. We have and will again sail under the Golden Gate when we are ready, not serve as vessels to transfer loot, gold and silver to a government and its enablers that is clearly out of control. So happy Monday, happy President's Day, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Can I see the hands of all the people who've been brutalized, arrested without cause by the Sausalito Police Department? I mean, show the country, show the country on President's Day how your civil rights, your constitutional rights have been violated by the Sausalito Police Department, those very individuals who raised their hand and swore to uphold and defend the Constitution have now become criminals and committing criminal acts against people of this community and including journalists. And I want to bring on a journalist of 25 years in this community who was viciously beaten and seized, had his camera equipment seized, 
had uh, Sergeant Georges blocking his his camera as he was attempting to film the brutality against the homeless, been made homeless by the city of Sausalito. Now, Mr. Jerry Porgy. Yeah, all right, gentlemen. Yeah. Thank you all for coming out and showing your support and interest in this case. It's uh, it's weird to be standing here in the middle holding the microphone. I'd prefer to be over there behind the camera documenting this, but you know, I didn't make that choice. My choice was to cover this this travesty, this injustice committed by the county of Marin and the city of Sausalito in the creation and the the uh, what do you call it? The they're creating homelessness. They're exasperating the problem and not doing anything to fix it. And when, when they attempt to fix it, they make it worse. And they cover it up and they lie. And so that's a very compelling story. I was there just to witness this travesty going on to tell the rest of Marin County what's going on here from a very you know honest look from the inside out, not the typical fluff piece on homelessness. And was silenced by the police department. Thomas Georges decided to make me stand here today and talk about the brutality, the injustice, and the corruption within the Sausalito Police Department. We have we have a police department or a goon squad, whatever you want to call them, with no oversight. There is no oversight of this police department. And it's a sleepy town, Sausalito, who suspects corruption here. And so it's allowed to fester and fester, and it's, it's, it's they pick the wrong person to arrest, they pick the wrong person, the wrong person to uh, assault, and then they tried to lie about it, and, you know, not okay, so, not okay, <laughs> not okay. so, you know, as, as a journalist, my intention is to draw spotlight, spotlights on injustices, and that's what I'm doing. I set out to tell the story of homelessness, but here I am now talking about policing in Marin and corruption within the police department, which is something homeless people have had to fight for years, and people just didn't pay attention. And That's you right. know, now that it's happened to me, I'm, I'm glad people are paying attention to you know the abuse of power here in Sausalito. So. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Thank you for your bravery, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, you are the creating spirit of freedom. Yes. To see you on your knees, to see these criminals over you, twisting your arm behind you, tearing your rotator cuff was absolutely shocking. And, and they will answer for that. Uh, I'd like to ask the people here, though, what is it that you want? What is it that you have this petition? What does this petition want? Justice. Justice. Fire Jeremy. Sergeant George's right now. What do you want? Fire Sergeant George's. When do we want it? Now. All right. When do we want? Fire Sergeant George's. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Fire Sergeant George's. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Fire Sergeant George's. When do we want it? Now. So in addition to that, <laughs> which, you know, this, there needs to be discipline. Uh, for his choices in action, and he, he's, you know, a commanding officer, so it, it shows you how high up the corruption goes. Really what I'm after is change. Really what I'm after is to ensure that my daughter and future generations are safe from the brutality of the police system, a system that has allowed Georges to abuse people for years. There, there's references years old of him violating and, and physically assaulting people um, and he's still he's still employed by the, the police department um, and then the system allowed an officer a known liar he, he's on the Brady list they they based his they based their actions of seeking a search warrant to violate my First Amendment civil right based off of the word of a police officer on the, the DA's Brady list. Yeah, like how is he an effective officer at this Nick point? White. So I want change. Yeah. 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 I want change. I want to ensure the safety of journalism, the protect this the sanctity of journalism and the freedom of press to tell these stories and not allow governments to silence us. How many journalists have been arrested? 
so far in this country. So I don't have that number just, off hand, oh, but it's it's, a, it's, uh, it's 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 staggeringly it's it's growing exponentially. Two years ago, I think there was 54. I think the year before that there was 154, yes. or maybe 200, and and we're at like 30 now. So the numbers are going up, and you know CNN. There was a reporter arrested live on camera That's right. by the police department, right. and yeah. we can't let this corruption continue. Very good, very good. Now, when George's and these other cops injured Jeremy, they didn't just hurt him, they hurt his entire family. So I want his wife, it, she's also a plaintiff in this lawsuit, Amy, to come and talk about how this affected your family as long with your daughter Mia. Your, 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 please come. On November 30th, I got a phone call from my mom. She said Jason had just called her. She couldn't make out what he was saying, but she heard screaming in the back. She told me to keep my phone close because something didn't feel right. And if you know my mom, she says that all the time. <laughs> and more often than not, things usually turn out okay. My parents spent a lot of time here in Sausalito at the homeless camp where tragedies ha often happen, especially at the hands of police. I brushed my mom's phone call off though. I thought to myself, dad's there, he's documenting. It'll turn out okay. He's exceptional at de-escalating situations. I've seen it myself. I come back five minutes later to a text from my mom. Dad got arrested. I felt like many others that day, vulnerable, confused, and stuck. Stuck because dad got arrested, mom's at work, where do I go, who do I call? But stuck because my dad is often a safe ground, a voice of reason, and someone who can just make you feel okay. We later found out from videos that many of you have seen that the screaming in the back of the phone call was a violent, unhinged police officer tearing my father's rotator cuff in a vengeful and unnecessary arrest. As a family, we've had to come to terms with the fact that my dad is a victim of police brutality. We've all seen the videos on social media. We've heard stories from families who are not as fortunate to have their loved ones here to tell the story themselves. But never in a million years would we have thought that my dad would be the focus of those petitions and protests. We often get faced with the question, how can I help? What can I do? Well, Sausalito, you as a city need to come to your own terms. This is not just happening in big cities like San Francisco and Oakland with high crime rates. Police brutality is happening here. Yes. In your backyard. On the streets you drive to take your children to school. On the roads you walk on your Sunday strolls. It's happening here. So I beg of you, my family begs of you, to know what's happening in your community. Listen and be willing to hear the ugly because it's there. Yes. Uh, this, uh, this is Mr. David Anderson, my co-counsel. We are in negotiation with other cities in Marin County about police brutality. Uh, here, Jeremy was filming while black as a journalist, and he gets beat up. We've had other African Americans here in Marin County conducting their business in their own businesses while black. This hatred has metastasized across this country and it has to stop. And I'm here to share a abolitionist with you, Mr. Dave Anderson, who's been fighting this fight with me in the trenches. He's also the attorney for the NAACP. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Jeremy. 
It is my professional and personal honor to have been invited by my good friend Charles Bonner to be part of Jeremy and his family's legal team. Uh, this is a just and righteous cause. Um, for some reason, those that are uh, charged with enforcing the law, uh, they swear to it, they wear badges to it, uh, they are here to protect the citizens in this country. Uh, unfortunately, too often, those charged with enforcing the law become the lawbreakers themselves. They need to be held accountable when that happens. That's why we're all here today. Accountability. Fundamental obligation of every American, any color, any belief. That's what we are supposed to do. When we do not learn the lessons of history, we are bound to repeat them. Mr. Bonner and I have represented uh, two black shopkeepers over there across the bay in Tiburon, uh, Holly and uh, Yama Khalif, uh, who are still fighting their own cause for justice, freedom, equal treatment, regardless of color of skin or belief. And that's what we're entitled to. That's what we work for. That's why we live here. Uh, it's a fundamental right, but it is also a fundamental obligation when law enforcement chooses to violate their sacred duty of protecting you, you all, um, everyone who insist that we be treated fairly and equally. Charles, I look forward to our pursuit for justice. One more thing, I have lived here in Marin County for 30 years. My law practice is just down the road in Mill Valley. Um, and I've practiced for 43 years, and this is one of the more important cases that I have been honored to join your team. Thank you. But it's, it's personal to me, Dave, as well. You have a copy of my book there, uh, The Tip of the Air, if you can hold that up. But in that book, there's a chapter I wrote uh, called From Selva to Sausalito. And I've been living and practicing in this city since 1985, 37 years. I'm actually saddened and disappointed that my town would have a cop like Sergeant, Sergeant Georges and a chief like John Robacher who would abuse the homeless, who will create the homeless, who will abuse the journalist who's carrying out his constitutional First Amendment right to document the abuses. So this is very personal. So in terms of what Jeremy said, he wants change. You know, what this lawsuit is about, that we have filed, is about change. What change do we want? Well, the Constitution of the United States starts with we, the people. Not we, the police. That's right. Not we, the Democrats. That's right. Not we, the Republicans. Yeah. Not what we, the uh, Congress people or the mayor. But we, you, we, the people, under this Constitution. We, the people, hire the President of the United States. We, the people, hire the Vice President. We hire all of our elected officials. So one of the changes we want here, basically threefold. One, we want all police contact with citizens who are not involved in conduct that is, that's a threat to public safety to stop. There's no reason to arrest Jeremy, none whatsoever. First of all, Jeremy didn't commit a crime. He absolutely had a constitutional right to stand there as a journalist and as a human being to film. He had one of those inalienable rights to life, liberty, and to pursue happiness. That's what our Constitution started with, with the Declaration of Independence. So the police officers violated that basic right. The police officers committed a crime. So the number one change we want is to see any human being that is exercising their constitutional rights 
if there is a violation that the police officers perceive, then they can issue a citation and require that person to show up in court. There's no reason to arrest them or touch them at all. So no more pedestrian arrest unless it's a threat to public safety. Number two, vehicle stops. People are dying across America because they have a taillight out. They have an air freshener hanging from their mirror. They have an expired license plate. There's no reason for us human beings as a species to be killing each other over such nonsense. So change number two, no vehicle stops unless there's a threat to public safety. We go through the Golden Gate Bridge. There used to be 10 or 12 people that we paid. We paid their 401ks, we paid a salary, we paid their health care. Now, when you go through the Golden Gate Bridge, is there any individual there? No, they take a picture of your license plate and you get an invoice. Unless there's a threat to public safety, no vehicle stops. Unless there's a threat to public safety, instead, cops can take a picture of the license plate, send a citation, just like you get from the Golden Gate Bridge, and the person appear in court. Yeah. Yeah. These protections are to protect the police officers. We're going to call this the Jeremy Porgy Police Protection Act. Because it's, it's going to stop, it's going to stop police from endangering themselves and creating hostility towards the police because the police are assaulting the people. And when the police assault the people, what do the people do? They will rise up. Historically, they have risen up and they've taken over the government. That's why we got the Constitution, because the people in this country rose up against England. But the people only take abuses for so long. Lastly, the third change. We want a police citizen review board with the power to hire and to fire and to discipline police officers, and they don't have a right of appeal. If we can hire the President of the United States, if we can hire the Vice President, the Senators, and the Congress, and the Mayor, if we can hire all these elected officials as the people, why can't we hire the people that we give guns and billy clubs and mace and instruments of torture? Why do we leave that to someone that we don't know who? That's not democratic. America now is the only country in the Western world since Nazi Germany where the people are afraid of the police. It shouldn't be that way. The police, our servant, we pay their salaries, they should be afraid of us. Yeah. <laughs> now, they're afraid now. And that is what's going to happen, my dear brother. Because this lawsuit carries out the mandate, the United States Constitution, to make sure that our First Amendment right of free speech, our First Amendment right of the press, our Fourth Amendment right to not be seized and searched illegally, and our Fourteenth Amendment right to of liberty, those three important rights enshrined in our Constitution, that's the mandate. Now, these cops, they singled out the only African-American journalists there. There were women journalists, there were other men journalists. Why did they sing out the only African-American journalists? because they are saturated like a sponge with hate. Yep. Now we know the antidote to this virus is love. 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 But they won't take the vaccine. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so we have to have the mandate, yeah. which is the United yeah. States Constitution. Yeah. And that's what this lawsuit is, is to enforce the mandate. Yeah. Okay, and so if anyone has any questions, yes. Yeah, my name is Steve Seltzer, it's work week. One of the questions is that the attack on journalists, as you were saying, uh, Jeremy, is San Francisco, Brian Carmody, a police went into his home, took, wrecked him and, and wrecked his equipment, grabbed his equipment. Uh, the question is, is why aren't the district attorney and Rob Bonner, the attorney general, enforcing the SHIELD Act in California, which is supposed to protect journalists? And the question, why aren't they? Because they're a clear violation of journalist rights. Isn't that a violation of the law that they're not enforcing the California law, which is supposed to protect journalists? It, absolutely. In fact, as recent as October of 2021, Governor Newsom signed into law another law to protect journalists. You shouldn't need another law other than the First Amendment. But the police officers continue to violate the rights of journalists. And that's why this lawsuit has to reinforce that right. Uh, of, of journalists, reinforce their right of the First Amendment. So are these laws are not being enforced, and because these particular offices 
committed crimes against Jeremy. We are going to take this lawsuit and first give it to the district attorney of, San, uh, of Marin County to prosecute these cops for the assault and the battery and the false imprisonment and the torture that they did to Jeremy. Secondly, we're going to give the lawsuit to Rob Banta at the governor's, uh, the U.S., the, the California Attorney General, to prosecute the, these cops. And lastly, we will also give it to the U.S. Attorney, Mary Garland, to prosecute these cops. These cops committed crimes. And when you commit a crime, you go to jail. These cops need to go to jail. We are not going to tolerate this abuse again under my watch in my city as long as I'm an attorney. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so it's uh, it's so exciting to that that vision is so exciting, especially when we consider that every single boat home that's been crushed on Anchorage, not a single person had a day in court to contest a boat being crushed, their homes being crushed, their possessions being crushed, being stolen by employees at the United States Army Corps, private contractors in San Rafael, stealing people's possessions after they've been evaded. So, I, I wanted to connect that with some of the people from the Anchorage who are living under basically terroristic policies. And I just, that sound right? Yes, that sound right? So uh, I want to pass it off to Arthur Bruce yes. and Bob Schulke. Uh, Arthur Bruce recently was attacked by an employee of the city of Sausalito, Urban Alchemy, um, and, and it sustained injuries, was sent to the hospital. I just want to hand it over to you, Arthur. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, found an overwhelming amount of support from uh, from the community and uh, reporters and journalists uh, since since my attack last week. Uh, I've been anchored out here for six years. Facebook just reminded me that six years ago today I was sailing across the beautiful bay to Richardson Bay, and I, I really didn't know much about it except that it, you could anchor here, and um, it was closer to my work being a landscaper in Marin County and um, yeah I just had no idea what I was getting into and it's been a, an amazing thing to be a part of it's been mostly sad and beautiful um, if you could imagine getting in your car and leaving for work and there's two bulldozers parked outside your house and they might crush your house while you're at work that's what we live with on the water. Um, I went under the radar for three years until the RBRA started to crack down and hired their enforcer, Curtis Havel, to violate our civil rights <clears throat> with no due process, crushing people's boat homes, making them homeless during a pandemic. It's just unconscionable. I don't like bullies. And when Curtis Haver began to bully me and bully us, it did not end well for his career. <laughs> now I'm being bullied by Urban Alchemy, who works in coercion with the Sausalito Police Department. And the Sausalito Police Department is covering for Urban Alchemy. And Urban Alchemy is covering for the Sausalito Police Department. A few hours before I was assaulted, I was doing an interview with NBC5 and I told them they were putting trouble on top of trouble, that this was not sustainable, and it was going to end with someone getting hurt or killed. And a few hours later, I was in the hospital with a sprained wrist and some torn ligaments. And um, after I went on Monday to ask for a copy of my police report at the police station, the cops started gunning for me. They're harassing me now, threatening me with citations. Uh, it's just a god-awful waste of taxpayer money, and I just got to echo everything. Somebody, everything everybody said today. This got to be. It's got to be reformed. This has to stop. others at the encampment and Arthur and in yeah. fact the night before they harassed yeah, Arthur so before she shares her story I just want to point out a fact about Arthur so, uh, and uh, he you know as courageous and amazing as he is 
the police department continue to harass him. Um, they do arbitrary things like make it hard to park next to where your tent is, and he got a permit. And legally applied, and they gave him a permit to park there. Well, later that day or the next day, an officer came to take the permit away and give him his money back. He said, no, thank you, I don't want a refund. And the officer began to tease Arthur. He said, why are you shaking? Why are you nervous? Why are you scared? We're not here to hurt you. Not realizing how many months before his co-worker assaulted and hurt me. So, the... Uh, the I don't know what the, the ignorance, the heartlessness, the brutality of this police department is just, it's, it's unconscionable. And the training, you know, and, and resources seem non-existent. There's, there's no de-escalation techniques. In fact, you have an officer making fun of somebody who's anxious and scared to be around a police officer. And that, that just is, again... Okay. I wasn't intending on speaking today, but I lost it after that because, um, yeah, I've been complaining about the department for many, many, many months, and it's fallen on deaf ears, and um, I witnessed George's beat Jeremy, and that never should have happened um, because he's one of the officers along with Stacey Gregory and Nick White that I've also complained about. And I just wanted to point out that when we met with you, Mr. Bonner, there's one thing that I said to you, and that was, don't let them get away with this. So I was really happy to read what you filed. Um, and yes, the city has contracted with Urban Alchemy to provide what they call security, enhanced security management to the camp. And this is a group of ex-offenders, and they have some, many of them, um, probably the good majority exhibit they, they have not have been fully rehabilitated and that's demonstrated in their behavior and um, I was assaulted by one of their employees and transported and had a corneal abrasion the following week the night before Arthur was assaulted I witnessed someone from the team um, aggressively approach him and intimidate him verbally out of the tennis courts when he was just trying to bring a woman who's wheelchair bound her belongings that were being moved from the park area to the courts and then the fall and i reported it to urban alchemy the next day and that night he was assaulted by that staff member so um i'm glad so many people are coming together to draw light to this it's going to take a whole team yes. um to expose it to bring change and i want to thank you so much mr bonner for thank taking you. this case thank you. and we, anyone who wants a copy of the lawsuit my legal assistant tony has copies you can give copies to anyone who needs a copy and with that anyone has any additional questions otherwise uh, we will uh call it a wrap okay all right, thank you all for coming. Yes. May I address the crowd? Certainly. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Emilio Pineda. I, I walked my way from Guatemala all the way to the United States sometime 30 years ago. I, I was running away from, uh, of course, our foreign policy, destroying countries that are beautiful in, for the benefit of corporations. And I have seen the attacks. I have seen the tactics, and it's the very same thing that this police department is using yes. against their very own people. So it is time to end. Yes. It is time to start a new life in yes. America. I believe this country yes. has what it takes, and what it takes is all of us. Yes. We, the people of the United States, regardless of color, origin, but we are here now, and we are part of this beautiful place yes. that we need to keep working to make it a better democracy. And thank you all very much. What's your name again, brother? My name is Emilio Pineda. Emilio, good to you. Any other questions? Okay, again, no other questions, we'll call it a wrap. Thanks everybody for coming. Everybody stand strong and stand united for the Constitution. Everyone on the anchor.
72 hours notice that they were going to start clearing. Similar to what you would do on a street. You caught 72 hours, and you can park here, and then you need to move. Well, they gave everyone 72 hours notice, but what was happening is, as soon as the person left their boat, it was now an unoccupied vessel, and they would come in and throw the boat like that. Oh. And they would tow it back. And um, they started punching holes in the bottom of this boat so that people could take their boats back. Thereby undoing any, you know, um, do justice or, or, or way to fight it, right? Um, so, the story essentially is the county is causing more homelessness. They are taking people's boats and homes. One of the first boats they took this woman was on shore to tend to her husband. He was dying and he passed away. She went back to her home. So because she wasn't on it, they declared it ocean debris. Um, now she was living on the streets of Sausalito. She was harassed continuously by a police officer because she was sleeping in her car. She was degraded, she had made fun of, and then people started to band together. The people lost their homes on the boat, or on the anchorage, their homeless people, they started to band together. And they took up residence at Dundee Park. Well, the city didn't like that much more. They said the soil there was contaminated uh, from other construction. And they wanted to move one mile down the road. Um, it's well known in Sausalito that we're in shit. So it's below sea level. And so just by that nature, the water the water ground. And yeah, so anytime it rains, it's a different. So they were forced there. And what ended up happening is it was, the theory is that it was an old septic beach field. And they put these holes in the on a field full of human feces. And the levels were astronomical. And so the homeless residents started asking to be moved. They started asking, this is not right, we want to go back to the original location, which incidentally the soil had been removed and cleaned, no longer contaminated. They wouldn't let them move back. They instead forced them out of the field and put them on the tennis surface. So that's just one instance in Sausalito. This is a fight happening up and down the county. And so I set out to tell the story about you know, the different cities and their approach to homelessness. And Sausalito, by far, is the most inhumane in their approach. And, um, they have not invited any of the homeless to the table to figure out a solution. They keep, make, they keep enforcing their ideas of what they think is going to help. They often don't think these people are homeless. They call them out of town advocates that just want to live rent by rent. So that's why I started to tell the story. So that brings us back to where you were that day. It wasn't like there was a protest happening that day. There wasn't any. Was there something specifically happening? So that day, um, the, I got a call from one of my subjects in tears saying his boat's being crushed. So they had taken it, brought it back to the army. He calls and says my boat's being crushed. And so we rushed down there to document him, you know, going through his, his, his boat. So that's why we were there. So that was a separate incident. So actually, so that wrapped. Then we heard screaming, and we went to the camp, and we saw somebody in distress. And that was why the police were there. They were there for an alleged assault, uh, camper on camper. I was just documenting the police interaction with the homeless because part of the story is their treatment of the homeless and their disregard. There's been incidents where police employees have thrown rocks at homeless people um, and then refused to take police work or documented. They were denied, uh, police were denied by two officers denied to take the crime. So that, that's how they're handling things here. So why I was there was working on a story specifically about this boat, which morphed into life that came police And they didn't want you documenting how they were dealing with that boat? In the affidavit, they say they didn't want to be on camera doing nothing. They say they didn't want to appear as if they were doing nothing because they what tactically what they were doing was waiting for this woman who was in distress to get a ride home or to go ride to her parents' house. So they were waiting for her 
So that's what the ride. police are saying. Isn't yeah. Well, that's what. Yes. Okay. That's all, I mean. That's what they were saying on scene. Here was this assault. Um, this woman in crisis. She's going to go to a family member's house. And we'll wait for them to pick her up. And while they were waiting, they didn't want to appear to be sitting around doing nothing. So they say they didn't want to be on camera. And they split up. And there you go. So just to have the facts that you were arrested, taken to jail, right? I was arrested, uh, injured during the arrest, taken to the hospital, uh, cleared, and then taken to jail. With, without any idea of what I was being charged with or arrested. I was never Mirandized. I was never told I was being arrested. I was never told what was going on. It wasn't until I got to the county jail when they said, you're being charged with X, Y, and Z that I... Um, so the charges have changed, and they were continually changing while I was in the jail. They ultimately settled on three charges, which are in there, um, and one of them was injuring an officer, resisting arrest, and uh, I think the other charge was interfering with official duties, which are all after the fact charges. They're all behaviors and charges that happen after an interaction with an officer. They don't lead up to an officer arresting them. It's a reaction to the interaction. So it didn't make any sense to me. I had no idea what was going on until I got to jail and they said, you're being charged for battery and injuring an officer. And I'm like baffled because the officer was there. He continued with his shift. He got to the police station. He was writing a report. Nobody asked him if he was okay. He didn't appear injured at all, and so now I'm being charged and hurting it. Like, it didn't make sense with, with $15,000. So you paid the bail? So, yeah, we, ba we bailed out, and yeah, I got out the next day. Right, so no, we, we, we didn't have the 15000 so we had to bail bail on so we paid 10% for the route. Yeah. The charges were rejected. They weren't just dropped. The DA was not buying the story. And they issued a statement. And the statement was really vague, but it essentially said, we can't prove this charge. And then you read the affidavit and witness testimony, and there's a lot of discrepancies. How were you injured? I was injured during the arrest. So while the, the officer physically attacked, and then through, like, on the ground while they were handcuffing my shoulder, he started to cut out the side So I they got they didn't use two sets of cuts, which is now the standard. They used one set of cuts, forcing my wrists together, which and then as they, they uh, dragged into the car, they were extra rough. So why was the charges dropped? Why is this important to you? Because there's no accountability. There's no accountability for the Sasso Police Department. They did away with their citizens' oversight, which was the only oversight. And my best friend in the inside, I would have took this watchdog or whatever you want to call it, the Sasso Police Department. They did away with that years ago. I'm suing to create change. I'm suing to enact policy that makes it safer for both police officers and the citizens that they protect. So, police officers often say the most dangerous aspect of their job is pulling people over. Like, know who they can do. And it could be something as simple as expired registration. And that is still the most dangerous part of their job. So, let's do it. Let's keep officers safe so they can focus on keeping us safe without the anxiety and because like, somebody under stress doesn't make the same decisions. And officers are supposed to be trained to do that. It, it, it doesn't seem like it's happening. Has anything happened to these officers who are still out working? I don't know anything about that. I don't know. I've seen them out, all three on the streets, but I don't know anything about this one. That was the one. I think that covers everything on my end, so thank you so much.